Good morning, everyone. It's really interesting when you stand up here, you can gradually see it getting, or hear it getting quieter and quieter. Anyway, it's lovely to be here, and it's lovely to be able to worship this morning. Uh, greetings to everyone, and especially those who are here for the first time. We pray that uh, the Lord will richly bless you in our fellowship together. Just a few notices. Um, just to remind us all that there's an, the um, all-in-one services now continue right the way through to the 3rd of September. And uh, please remember afterwards there's tea and coffee out the back. So please come and, and join us and have fellowship together. Um, from the first Sunday in, in August, there are going to be two offering boxes now. We mentioned that before. Uh, so instead of a collection, there's going to be um, two offering boxes, one at the back by the booth and one in, in, in the front here. So um, after the 1st of August, if you want to give your offerings that way, that would be a tremendous blessing to us all. Uh, 10th of September, I've been asked to say there's a picnic in Willsby Woods, weather permitting. So we're looking forward to some good weather on that day. And then um, the 21st of September, um, Christianity Explored will be on that uh, particular day. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, Jacob, you've got an announcement for us, I believe. Good morning. Um, we had our first two summer events last week with the um, youth moving out on Monday and the family moving out on, on Friday. There was a great turnout at both, particularly at the... Um, at the family moving out, there were about 100 people here um, watching the film and hearing a bit about um, a short gospel talk afterwards. Um, so thank you for your prayers for those events and just pray for the people that came to them that they may be challenged by what they heard and want to seek out more and find out more in the future. Um, next, the GBC Youth Fest, the sleepover. If you... Um, have forms to give in, then I can take them today. If you've not got a form and would like to come, then speak to me afterwards. And then finally, the fun day on the 2nd of September. Um, if you would like to help and haven't already spoken to me, then come catch me afterwards. Um, no matter what your ability is, whether you like talking to people about Jesus, so you can be in the evangelism tent, whether you like... Um, face painting and can help with face painting, whether you like helping kids do craft and can help in the craft tent, whether you like um, helping serve barbecue food, whether you want to help give out leaflets in the run-up to the event, or whether you just can just pray for the event before um, any help that you can give would be greatly appreciated as we look forward to welcoming hundreds of people into the church grounds, maybe for the first time, to hear about you, Lord. Amen. Okay, thank you. Look forward to uh, having Liam speak with us uh, later on this morning um, on the theme of fellowship uh, from, from God's Word. Uh, before we continue and sing our first song, uh, let me just read a few verses of encouragement to us from the Scripture. Peter says in his second letter, some wonderful encouragement, isn't it? Grace and peace be yours in abundance, through the knowledge of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Yes, God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who's called us to his own glory and goodness. God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Isn't that a thrill? Well, we don't have any music this morning. We're going to have it coming through from the back and onto the screen. So let's stand up and praise the Lord then after thinking about that and sing that song together, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, who like me his praise should sing. Let's stand and join together in worship. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, to feed thy tribute bring ransomed healed restored forgiven who like me his praise should sing praise him praise him praise him praise him praise the everlasting and favor 
same as ever, slow to chide and swift to bless. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him for His faithfulness. Father, like He tends and spares, Hey, good morning. Good morning. Um, just before I forget to say, um, the children will be leaving during the next song. And during these weeks, during the summer, we will be having just one group for whichever age children are here. And that will be meeting through the back. So it will be all in together for the summer Sundays. And that's during the next song. So today's big words are two for the price of one we have disciple and apostle now if you were here last sunday or if you've had a chance to watch the um, youtube service you will know that jason spoke quite a lot about apostles and explained perfectly last time what an apostle was now of course the children weren't in for that so we'll just have a quick reminder. So we know in the Bible that Jesus chose 12 people to be the disciples. And then that these 12 would also become apostles. Now, there was a bit of a switch around, obviously, because Judas um, did not turn out to be who um, most people thought he was. Judas died and then was replaced later. And then also, a little while after that, we read about Paul, a lot about Paul, and Paul was also an apostle. So what was an apostle? So Jason helpfully told us last time that apostles were chosen, called, and commissioned or sent out by Jesus directly. And kind of the qualification for being an apostle was that you had to be a witness of Jesus's death and resurrection. And although Paul obviously wasn't actually at those events, but Paul was um, slightly different in that Jesus met him in a very miraculous way later. And then the apostles were given these special tasks and responsibilities. So the apostles then were a very particular group of people in the Bible. We are not apostles. Disciples, however, is something a little bit different. We think of the apostles as disciples, but 
there were other disciples as well, other followers of Jesus. And so the word disciple, as it says there, it means people who are learners, people who are followers, and people who are kind of a bit like apprentices of people. So we're going to have a bit of a quiz to start with. So we're going to show you some hidden pictures. I think there's four of these. And um, well, because school's finished, we'll allow shouting out, all right? So because we're not at school this week. So as soon as you know what this picture is, give us a shout. Go. Chef, absolutely, yeah. So chefs train from others, don't they? They maybe go to college, but they also learn from other people. Right, next one. I can't see these on here, so. Hairdresser. Hairdresser, yeah, hairdressers learn how to cut hair and how to style hair. Next one. Oh, yes, over here. Bricklayer, yes, a bricklayer. So, you know, we can all have a go at laying bricks, but we have to learn how to do it properly from other people. We become an apprentice. And last one. Plumber. It is plumber. Well done. Yeah, yeah. Some people here probably had a go at plumbing. <laughs> and if you don't do it properly, <laughs> it can be very messy. I can see somebody nodding over there who's obviously tried. <laughs> but to be a good plumber, you need to learn from other people. So these people could all have been apprentices, learners, learning how to do something by being with people and having people to show them. So I wonder how we can be a disciple today. So if we're going to be a disciple of Jesus, we need to learn by studying his word, by reading the Bible, by getting together, by learning with um, other people and learning about Jesus and learning how to follow him. All of us, if we're Christians, are called to follow Jesus. So we're going to have a bit of a kind of a game here. Now, I do need six people up at the front Right, come on, Hello. we've got some volunteers, or sort of volunteers. We have an incentive. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, perfect. Come and stand up here, people. Okay, so, we are going to be followers of Jesus, right? And we're going to find out what that means. Now, it can sometimes be a bit difficult to follow Jesus, Sometimes we're not really sure whether we're doing the right thing. Sometimes it can seem a bit confusing. Sometimes other people put us off. Right, so what I want you to do, we've got some footprints up here. And I want you to see if you can follow the green footprints. Pick them up as you go along, and there should be a message at the end of the green ones, okay? Same for you, can you do dark blue? Okay. Uh, uh, Zavania, can you do red? Can you see if you can follow the yellow ones? Ooh, can you see any yellow ones? Ooh, over there, look. Can you have a go at pink? Have you got it? Right, stand here. You have a go at pink, and you do light blue. Right then, when you've got them, bring them back over here. That's it, follow the footprints. We're going to have a look at that in a minute. Let's see if everybody's got theirs, or some people still, still looking. You might have to move some people out of the way, look. Who's looking for light blue? Are you looking for pink? Oh, well, you lost them. That way, look. This way. Can you see? Keep going. Keep going. Can you see the pink ones? Right then. So, let's have a look. Come and stand here with your footprints. So, dark blue first. Now, these are... People have all got messages for us. And can you read yours out? Don't be self-centred. Yeah. So the first thing says in the Bible, we are called to be disciples. And Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, 
take up their cross and follow me. So that means we can't always just do everything we want and think about ourselves. We have to be prepared to try and do what Jesus wants, even if it's a bit difficult or we don't really like the idea. Right, can you come this side because we've done yours? Green next, who's got green? Okay, can you read that or not? Uh, I don't know. Okay, so Zephan, you read it for us. Do what Jesus says in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> so, we need to learn our Bibles, study our Bibles, and do what Jesus says. Jesus said we need to de deny ourselves, and he says lots of other things which we're going to see, but we need to be willing to do what Jesus says. Can you go that side? Okay, so now we will have yellow. Can you read that? Love one another. Okay, yeah, that's not always easy, is it? Loving other people. Sometimes, well, we don't really like them very much. But the Bible says, no matter whether we like them very much, we need to be prepared to love them as Jesus would love them. Okay, yellow this side. What have you done? You've scraped your elbow. Oh, never mind. You'll show your mum in a minute. I think you're all right, really. <laughs> right, we have the red one. Are you ready? Shine for Jesus. Yeah, so we are called to be lights. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So we should be willing to show others how they too can know about Jesus. Okay, light blue. Tell other people. Yeah, tell other people. Be witnesses. Tell other people about Jesus. Jesus said to his followers, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, we are disciples and we need to tell other people so that they can become disciples too. This side. And pink one. Keep close to Jesus. Yeah. So we haven't got to do this on our own. We can't be disciples all by ourselves just by trying really hard. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we can see that if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple, we need to keep close to him. We need to pray. We need to read our Bible. We need to meet with others who can help us. We need to learn just like being an apprentice. And we need to do what we can do to make other disciples too. So let's just pray and then we'll have our rewards, okay? Father God, thank you that you call us to be disciples. And even though we don't feel that we are worthy, that you call us to follow you, to keep close to you, to learn from your word, to shine our light, to love other people with your love, and to help other people to become disciples too. So Lord, help us as we try and do this. Amen. Right, okay, thank you very much. One left. <laughs> We're going to sing our next song, The Rescuer, and during the song, uh, the offering will be taken, and after the offering, the young ones will go.
out to their uh, classrooms. So let's sing that together the rest of the way. Well, let's come to the Lord and let's pray together. As I was thinking about the service today and remembering that we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2, I thought it'd be really good if we could focus our thoughts and our prayers on something to do with that passage. So let's come to the Lord and pray. Shall we? Father, we thank you for that wonderful song we've just been singing. We thank you that many of us can say you are our rescuer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you've given us all that we have in Christ. We thank you for received it through faith in your shed blood, shed for us on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for that forgiveness of sin and that we've been accepted in your beloved. But thank you, Father, we're part of that heavenly company because we receive that eternal gift of eternal life through faith. Thank you, Father, for the way that you work in our lives through your indwelling spirit. And we thank you for your grace and your compassion and your love. Thank you for the comfort and encouragement that you bring. Thank you for your word. We pray, Father, as we hear that read soon and as we listen to it, 
that, Lord, you'll open our hearts to be prepared to hear what you have to say to us and be able to apply it in our daily lives. We pray together, Lord, that we might all as a church and fellowship live together in that spiritual unity and godly harmony that you want for us. Help us, Lord, to continue to be of one mind, keeping that same love, being united in that one spirit, for that one purpose of seeing you change our lives, transforming us into the wonderful image of your Son. We thank you, Lord, that this will abound to your praise and to your glory. Lord, help us day by day to have that humility of heart that Philippians talks about. But Lord, as we hear your word, we'll hear your word speaking to us and it will change us, change our lives and change our fellowship. We thank you, Father, that we can do nothing except your strength and your help in us. Give us that strength and that help, Lord, that we can always live our lives that will be bound to your praise. Help us, Father, also, Lord, in our daily lives to respond to the needs of others, that we'll be able to be an encouragement to those who need it. We think of the world that's in crisis. We remember, Lord, you've asked us to pray for the kings and all those in authority. We pray, Lord, for the different troubled parts of the world, that you will enable us to continue to pray for different countries Think again of Ukraine and others that are in great need. We pray, Lord, that the people in those countries that know you will be finding your strength and help and enablement. Pray too, Lord, for the children this morning in their classes, that they will be encouraged as they hear your word. We want to pray continually, Lord, for Colin and Val, for Les and Lynn, we Pray, Lord, for Avril and their family, that they might know your joy and strength and enablement, Lord, in each of their everyday lives. And Lord, as we think of this offering that we've just given, and the gifts we give you day by day, week by week, we thank you, Lord, that it's just an expression that, first of all, we've given ourselves to you. We pray you'll use these gifts to see your work here throughout the whole world extended to your praise and to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to have Joy with us this morning, and uh, Joy's got Chloe with her, and uh, they're going to, uh, um, Joy's going to play How Deep the Father's Love for Us, and Chloe, you're going to sing that, right? Yes, okay, thank you. Oh, 
Today's reading is found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and can be found on 1179 or 1179. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Amen. Good morning. How is everyone? Good. Okay. Um, in the film Apollo 13, I don't know if many of you have seen it, but the lead character, the astronaut, as he's preparing to go to the moon, he likes to go out into his garden and he likes to stick his thumb up against the moon and he covers the moon with his thumb. And it's an indication of his desire uh, and dream of going to the moon. But many of you know the story, uh, and as they're flying through space, there's a problem. And instead of a mission to get to the moon, it now becomes a rescue mission to get these astronauts back. And there's one scene in the film where the, the head astronaut, he looks at the Earth out of his window, and he places his thumb, and he covers the Earth with his thumb. And it shows us that his new desire is to get back to the Earth, and as he does this, his two co-astronauts, they're arguing uh, and they're bickering, and he turns to them uh, and he says to them, gentlemen, what are your priorities? And I like this scene because it's a question which I think it's good for us to ask ourselves every single day as believers. We can wake up in the morning and we can ask ourselves, what are our priorities? Now we've looked or well, we are looking uh, over the summer uh, at this new series, Moving Towards Maturity. And it's a series that kind of links to that question. As believers, what are our priorities? And what has God provided for us as believers to aid our spiritual growth? So we began last week by looking at uh, the apostles' teaching. And we began in Acts chapter 2 and saw how the believers there uh, met together and they listened to the apostles' teaching. But we also see in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 42, that they devoted themselves to fellowship. And so today we're going to look at this theme uh, of fellowship. We're going to look kind of in a broad sense of fellowship, keeping that question of what is priorities. Uh, and we're going to look really at two things. We're going to see why is fellowship important for our growth as believers? And then we're going to look at what is the basis or what is the heart of Christian uh, fellowship. And again, Philippians is a good book to look at this because it's a book that is all about priorities. So some of the verses that we recognize from Philippians, Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he's showing again his own priority. He says in chapter three, verse eight, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus uh, my Lord. And he also says in Philippians 3, uh, chapter 13, he says here, he says, um, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal. So Paul was a man who understood his priorities. He had his priorities right. And he's writing a letter to the Philippian church to encourage them to have the same priorities and one of those priorities which he highlights over and over again in the letter is fellowship between uh, believers. And we see this all throughout the letter in various ways. We see it expressed uh, in prayer for each other. We see it expressed in love, encouragement, uh, emotional and practical support. We see it in exhortation and instruction. And we see it in care for one Another. Now, all these topics that I've just mentioned, we could go quite deep into some of those, uh, but we're not going to do that today because 
all of those things that mentioned, they're kind of expressions of fellowship or fellowship seen in action. But as we're going to see in our text this morning, um, these verses, they really talk about the importance and the basis and the heart of fellowship. So we're going to look uh, at those verses. So Paul begins here uh, at the start of verse one. He says, therefore, now we've dropped ourselves in halfway through a letter here, and we begin our text with a therefore. So we do need to go back a little bit to see the full uh, context, the broader context, so that we can understand this a little bit more. So it begins here by saying, therefore. Now, what is this therefore? Therefore, well, we find it um, in verse 27 of chapter 1. So Paul says there, um, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whenever I come and see you or only hear about you in my, in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. So chapter 2, verse 1 begins with a therefore, and Paul is linking back to what he's began here in verse 27. He instructs them to live their lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And he mentions two specifics uh, in verse 27 and 28. He mentions standing firm together, and he mentions boldness in the face of opposition. So two things he exhorts, the Philippians 2, standing firm together and boldness in the face of opposition. Now, to see why Paul is saying these things, it's helpful to have a little bit of a background on the situation the Philippians were in. Now, the Philippian church, Philippi, was uh, a Roman colony. And this meant that the culture they were in was Roman culture. Philippi was known as a Rome away from Rome. Uh, and the Philippian believers, they lived with constant pressure uh, and constant threats from the Roman government and then from other religious leaders. So as Philippi was a Roman colony, the culture of Philippi was Roman. And so the Philippian believers had this constant pressure to conform to this Roman culture that they were in. But there was also constant pressure to compromise in their faith. So in chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, we see that they're being pressured by a Jewish religious group who are trying to get them to compromise their faith in Christ and go back uh, to the Jewish law. And we also see that they're being compromised um, at the end of chapter 3 by another group that were connected to the church, but they were walking and living in a sinful and wicked and destructive lifestyle. So there was pressure to conform by the government, and there was pressure to compromise in their faith by other religious groups. In fact, if you have a time to go back and read Acts chapter 16, we see there, this is where Paul first goes to Philippi. And almost from the moment he arrives, he is under pressure, he's arrested, he's thrown into jail, and he's beaten. Now, this is a situation, I believe, that we can relate to quite well as believers today. So some of our brothers and sisters around the world face this maybe more directly. Uh, but we, in our culture today, can face these two threats. We can have the pressure to conform to the culture that we live in. And there was also a pressure to compromise on our faith. So we have the same pressure that the Philippians had. And how does Paul deal with this pressure to conform and the pressure to compromise? Well, he tells them here in verse 27 to stand firm together uh, and to have boldness in the faith, face of this opposition. And if you do have your Bible open, which would be good, if you can flick over to chapter 4, and if you read verse 1 of chapter 4, Paul says here, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Now, what is it when Paul says, stand firm in this way? Well, he's referring to everything he's just talked about in chapter 2 and 3. So at the end of chapter 1, Paul says, stand firm together. And at chapter 4, verse 1, he says, therefore, stand firm in this way. 
And all of the things contained in chapter 2 and 3 are Paul's instructions and exhortations of how it is the Philippian church can stand firm. So one of these ways the Philippian church can stand firm is fellowship and prioritizing fellowship. In fact, very quickly after Paul tells them to stand firm, he begins this passage in chapter 2 looking uh, at fellowship. So thinking about that first question we introduced, uh, at the start. Why is fellowship important for our growth as believers? Well, when we prioritize fellowship and when we understand Christian fellowship, it helps us to stand firm and it helps us to have boldness in the face of pressure. So as Paul goes through the letter, he mentions again all these things, care, support, encouragement, commitment to one another, uh, and exhortation. And all of these things help us to grow in the Christian life so Paul mentions uh, that believers need the prayers of other believers. And in chapter 1, verse 19, he mentions that he himself is dependent on the prayers of the Philippians. He mentions that we need emotional and practical support. And in chapter 2, verse 19, he highlights how Timothy has given those things to him. We need encouragement. So we need people who can come alongside us and can help us and can encourage us. And Paul has mentioned that he has had joy because Epaphroditus was able to provide that for him. Um, as believers, we need loving instruction and we need exhortation. And in chapter 4, Paul deals with two women in the church who were arguing with each other and he provides their instruction and exhortation. We need accountability in our lives. We need to be open. We need to be honest. And again, in chapter 1, Paul relays to the church his own struggles, his own thoughts, his own cares. Uh, and as believers, one key aspect of fellowship as well is that we have examples to follow. So highlighting again what Margaret just told us about. As believers, we follow the example of Christ, but we also follow other believers who are following the example of Christ. And in the letter, Paul highlights this aspect of fellowship as well. So as believers, we need to stand firm. We need to have boldness in the face of pressure. And as we engage in fellowship together, we help our fellow believers to grow in these things, and we ourselves will grow as well. So if we're not engaging in fellowship, if we're not doing these things that Paul highlights, we won't be growing, and we won't be part of helping other people to grow as well. So that's the first question. When we think about why is fellowship important for our growth as believers, it's all of those things mentioned, and they help us to stand firm and have boldness in the face uh, of pressure. So the next question we can look at now, and this is what we're going to talk about in chapter, in verse 1 to 4, what is the basis or the heart of healthy Christian fellowship? So we've mentioned all those things, they're kind of fellowship expressed, but what is the root, what is the motivation, what is the ground of all those things? Well, this is what we see uh, in chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. And... In this passage here, Paul mentions uh, three things. He talks about the foundation of shared spiritual experiences. We see that in chapter one. He talks about the conscious adoption of a shared mindset in verse two. And then he talks about the practical application of a humble attitude in verse three to four. So we're going to go through those things, but I've, I've given it three simple words to help us remember. So Paul talks about recognizing he talks about uh, responding, and he talks about uh, regarding. So the basis of healthy Christian fellowship, recognizing, responding, and regarding. And each of these three points, what Paul is going to do, he's going to mention four statements which explain his point, uh, two uh, in pairs of two each side. So we'll go through that. So if you look again to verse 1, it says there, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and uh, compassion. So what Paul does to begin with is he highlights the shared spiritual experience and foundation that the Philippians have between uh, each other. Now, why does Paul do it this way? Because his desire here is to encourage and exhort the Philippian believers to grow in their fellowship 
And he begins here, therefore. But why does he include verse 1? Well, we're going to see that it's actually very important for Paul and for us that before we engage in the practical side of fellowship, that we recognize and understand the spiritual bond of unity that we have, and that is the basis of our practical uh, fellowship. So Paul wants to remind them first about their spiritual shared reality before giving them the instruction. So he wants to show them the foundation first uh, and then shows them how they build on that foundation. Now, this is something Paul does uh, really quite common in all of his letters, and it's a nice way to help us to understand maybe how we can exhort and instruct other believers, is Paul so often reminds them of their spiritual state or reality first before then encouraging them in what to do. So Paul says here, uh, therefore, if, now this if, um, it's not a statement of uncertainty, and it can be understood as since. Uh, so we can think of it maybe as Paul saying, therefore, since you have any encouragement. Now, two of these statements that Paul makes here are about uh, state or position in a spiritual sense. And then two of these statements are about experience uh, in the spiritual sense. So Paul talks about here, really, who we are first and then what we've experienced together. So Paul wants to encourage the Philippians to grow in their fellowship, but he begins by reminding them the basis of how they can do it all uh, in the first place. So the first two uh, that are about our state or position, he says, any encouragement from being united with Christ and he says, if there is any common sharing or participation uh, in the Spirit. So, as believers, we have a new identity. We are now in Christ. And as believers, we enjoy fellowship with the Holy Spirit as he lives and dwells within us. So, the basis of any of our fellowship in practice is our fellowship with and in Christ and our fellowship with the Holy Spirit as well. So this is what we, this is, this is who we are uh, as believers. It's, uh, it's, we are spiritually uh, joined together in Christ and we have fellowship together with the Spirit. So positionally and spiritually, we are united together. This is the foundation of our fellowship. We are one in Christ and we all uh, participate in the same spirit. Paul then gives two other statements, and these are more about our shared experience that flow out from our being united and joined together in Christ. And these statements really reflect that we all have the same relationship with Christ. So we, we have experienced the benefit of being in Christ all the same way. So we've all been comforted by his love equally. We've all experienced his same tender affection for us all, uh, and we've all had the same compassion on us all. So this is what makes Christian fellowship so special and so unique, and this is why Paul begins here. So as believers, we are united spiritually by something deeper and greater than anything the world can have to offer, and we all have the same starting position, as it were, and our experience of Christ and being in Christ is absolutely equal. So if you go back to Acts 2, or you remember Acts 2, this was different people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different social standings, different uh, languages. And yet through believing in Christ, they were all suddenly united uh, together and they could fellowship together. So this is the basis and uniqueness of Christian fellowship. And therefore, Paul wants to begin by reminding the Philippian believers as this is who you are. So everything I'm about to say now is based on this fact. Since you have, since you are spiritually, positionally united and joined together in Christ, since you have the same experience of being in Christ, and since you all fellowship and are indwelt by the same spirit, therefore, you can act this way. So that's the first point, recognizing uh, this foundation of our shared spiritual experiences. Now, if we skip over the first point, then it will affect how we fellowship with other believers. We need to keep reminding ourselves of who we are uh, in Christ. So the second point that Paul makes now is he talks about 
responding, and this is found in verse two. So following on, this is this is the um, this links back to the therefore or the since. So since you all have the same shared spiritual foundation, therefore make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. So again, similar to what Paul did in, did in verse one, he makes four short statements. Two are about kind of state or position of our mind, and then the other two are about experience. So he begins these, these two, and the two about our state, our position, he says here, being like-minded um, and being of one mind. Now, this mind that Paul uses here, it is not just thinking. It's not just agreeing on the same things. It's not the simple thing as um, just having the same kind of understanding, but it's about a, a complete attitude or mindset or frame of mind. So because of the foundation of who we are in Christ and our shared spiritual foundation, we therefore are to have the same mindset and attitude towards things uh, as each other. So one outlook, one governing and ruling attitude that should be common amongst us all. So we should have the same mind, be like-minded, uh, but we should also be united in that same mindset. We should have one mind as well. The next two things are about our experience. Uh, and he says here, being of the same love and being one in spirit. So love here highlights action. It highlights service. And one spirit is highlighting and emphasizing our spiritual and practical unity. So we have the foundation of all being in Christ united together. And then in practice, we have the same outlook, the same mindset. And then there is unity in that. So believers, uh, we are to have the same pursuit, the same goals, the same desires, the same focus. Uh, and this is all based on having the same shared mindset and attitude. And then as we apply these things, as we live these things out in love, and in service and action, it should all be done together in unity. So, so far, when Paul's talking about the basis of fellowship, he's talked about recognizing that we all have the same shared spiritual foundation, and then responding to that by adopting the same shared attitude. But we can ask ourselves the question, what is this attitude that we as believers are to have? He says we are to be like-minded, and he says we are to be of one mind, so an attitude, a mindset. But what is that attitude and mindset uh, that we are to have? Well, Paul picks this up in verse 5, and he reveals that the attitude and mindset that we are to have is actually the attitude and mindset which Christ uh, had. Now, in the ESV, you see a nice little progression here. So, in the ESV translation, Paul talks about first about having the same mind, so think the same way. He then talks about believers having one mind, so apply it in unity. And then in verse 5, he says, have this mind, and talks about the mind of Christ. So have the same mind, then have one mind, and then have this mind, which is the mind of Christ. So we see from verse 5 to 8, as Paul explains what the mind of Christ is, that the attitude that we are to have, the shared mindset and outlook, is an other's focused attitude, which is marked by humility and service. So going from encouraging the believers about the shared spiritual foundation and exhorting them to have the same uh, united attitude, he now gets very practical and begins to show them what this attitude uh, is like. It's an others focused attitude marked by humility and service. And Paul begins to unpack what this looks like in verse three to four. So this is the third point. We've had recognizing, we've had responding, and now Paul talks about regarding, regarding others above yourself. So Paul says here in verse three to four, uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you, the interests of others. 
And again, like he's done all through this passage, he makes four statements in groups of two. There's two negative and two positive. So there's two things he says, don't do it like this. And there's two things he says, do it like this. So two negative and two positive. And the first two ways that we are not to act is that we are not to act out of selfish ambition uh, or vain conceit. So we're not to do anything um, from an attitude of selfishness or an attitude of pride. So rather than being an others-focused attitude with humility and service, it's a self-focused, me-focused attitude um, with pride and self-elevation. Now, this is all then about saying, I'm important, I'm first, and it's all about uh, elevating myself. Now, the problem with this attitude is that it does not help others to grow. Um, it doesn't deepen fellowship. It hinders and damages fellowship. And it's not how healthy fellowship can function if all of us are self-focused and me first, then the fellowship is practically non-existent together. Because as we try and build ourselves up, we also put others down at the same time. We can't build our own selves up and build others up at the same time. Um, the attitude of Jesus is seen again uh, in this verse here. Was his attitude was not to be served, but to serve others. So instead of having a self-focused attitude, Paul instructs them about having an others-focused attitude, the attitude of Christ who came to serve uh, and not be served. And again, he mentions two things to explain this. The first thing um, is in humility, humility regarding or valuing others above ourselves, and then also looking out to the interest of others. And when Paul says here, value or regard others as greater than yourself. He's not just talking about skill or talent or qualifications, um, but it's about serving. And as you will see, if we were to go through verse five to eight, Paul talks about Christ as one who came to serve and take on the form of a servant. So this is about serving. When we value our others greater than ourselves, we are seeing ourselves as not worthy to be served, and we are seeing others as worthy to be served instead. So it's a mindset that, that seeks to serve others rather than ourselves. And the second one here is about looking um, to the interest of others. Now, this is a really interesting phrase that Paul uses here, because what he's not trying to say here is he's not trying to say, as you go about your daily life, and as you're focused on yourself, and as you're taking care of your own interest, if you happen to see someone who also needs help, then you can help them as well. The word that Paul uses here in the original language has the idea of intense focus. So Paul is saying, disregard your own interest and actively look out ways to help others. It's not being concerned with your own interests but it's looking for ways that we can serve each other. So it's also a serving each other that's done at our own personal cost. So going from the same mind to one mind to this mind, the mind of Christ, he had an attitude of serving. He took on the form of service, and it was to his own personal cost, and it resulted uh, in his death, as Paul says, even the death on the cross. So when we serve each other as believers, it is done at our own personal cost. And so we can ask ourselves a real practical uh, question here. What would that look like? What would that look like in our church if every single one of us completely disregarded our own interests, looked to the interests of others, and sought out ways that we could serve each other or serve our brothers and sisters around the world, even at our own personal cost? What would that look like? What would that look like in the world if the world decided to do that? So Paul's talked about recognizing our shared spiritual foundation. He's talked about responding to this by having a united and ruling and governing mindset and adopting the same attitude. And then he's shown that this is expressed practically by regarding others uh, above ourselves. 
And so th there's a quote that someone once said, and he said something we need to think about is not how much we are willing to take in terms of suffering, but how much are we willing to give in terms of sacrifice? So this is a, this is a challenge, uh, something that we can think uh, about. But this is all done as the basis of us being united in Christ. And we do this having received encouragement from his love, um, encouragement from being united, comfort from his love. We've had his tenderness and compassion displayed on us. And we see his own attitude of being willing to come and to serve us and to die for us. So the basis of Christian fellowship are these three things here, recognizing, regarding, and responding. And then we express these. These are seen in action as we grow by encouraging one another to stand firm and to um, have boldness in the face of pressure and opposition. So what I thought we'd do, we're going to sing next. Um, we're going to sing the song, Oh, How Good It Is. But as we get ready to sing that song, song if we could have the, the verses back on the screen, if it's possible. So I thought what it might, might be nice to do as we end here, uh, if we just say all these verses together as a church um, and just say them out together and then I'll pray. So we'll say them together after three. One, two, three. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. Lord, we thank you uh, that it is truth, that it is complete truth, and we can depend on it, we can base our lives on it. And I pray that you'd help us this morning, um, sort of as we listen to what you have to say uh, to us through your word, that we would all be um, encouraged, but also challenged, Lord, and we would also see the example of Christ, Lord, and his attitude, his mindset, um, where he was willing to, to take the form of a servant, to serve and not be served, and then to die and give his life, Lord, even to death on a cross. And I pray that we, as believers, Lord, as we engage in fellowship with one another, that we would also adopt and be marked by that same attitude, Lord, to, to serve each other, to look out for the interests of all then to have this attitude of Christ, Lord, to serve and not be served, we pray. And help us this week to look for opportunities to do that, we pray. And we ask this now in your name. Amen. How 
Thank you, Liam. Um, as we go out, I was just thinking as Liam was speaking for the next verse in Philippians, I thought maybe we would use that as we close in prayer. Uh, Philippians 1.5, Paul says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Let's pray that as we go out. Father, thank you for our fellowship this morning. And we pray that as we go out, You'll in help us all, each one of us, that our attitude will be the same as that of Christ Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Please feel free to come and join us for tea and coffee out the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I could be in a broken place, pushing past all the many distractions. I'll make my way to a place of praise. Then I'll find my way to a place of praise. Where you're the